In this video, I'm going to describe the principles behind Newton's first and second laws of motion. Let me tell you about something amazing. When NASA or any space agency launches a spacecraft into space, most of the work is done in the first few minutes, launching it off of the Earth into space. Once a spacecraft has been accelerated up to a a very high speed, then no more, the, no more thrusters need to be turned on, no more force needs to be applied to the spacecraft in most cases, because there's nothing else to stop the spacecraft once it's already moving very fast. This is inertia, and it is one of the first principles that we'll deal with in the laws of motion. So for example, spacecraft like the one pictured here, can travel through space at tens of thousands of miles per hour even though they may not have a thruster firing at that moment. I'm going to use some language about motion that physicists use. For example, I'll use the word velocity, constant velocity, acceleration. Let me describe for you what I mean by constant velocity. Let's say that I have a toy car, like this fire engine, and it moves forward by 60 centimeters. It does so in 15 seconds. If it moves forward again another 60 centimeters in another 15 seconds, then I know that this has been traveling at constant velocity, and that the constant velocity is 60 centimeters divided by 15 seconds for 4 centimeters per second. That's the uh, constant velocity that it has. Now what I've just described is a speed, but I know it's a velocity because that this toy truck is moving to the right, and I'm defining it to move to the right, and that would be a positive uh, velocity for this particular uh, example. So our operational definition for velocity, which is how we can measure or uh, or actually uh, use it in practice is that velocity is a change in position over a change in time. And the little arrows above the letters here indicate that we're dealing with what are called vectors in physics. And that means that a velocity has both a magnitude associated with it and some direction that goes, uh, that goes with it. So I can be moving at 60 miles per hour and my direction would be north. Put those together and it's not just a speed, it's a velocity. A change in velocity is called an acceleration. And so if I go from 30 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour in the direction that I'm heading, let's say north, then that would be a, an acceleration. And if I did it in 15 seconds, then I would have changed from 30 to 60, so that's a 30 mile per hour change, and I did it in 15 seconds, and so 30 divided by 15 is 2, and so my acceleration would be 2 miles per hour uh, per second. We're also going to talk about forces. In science, force means something very specific, and as far as we know, there are only four known forces that are observable and measurable in nature. One of them is gravity, and we'll talk about gravity in another video, but it is, it is a force that exists in nature, and we describe it as a non-contact force, because objects can pull on each other with gravity even if they're not touching. There's also the electromagnetic force, and the strong and the weak nuclear forces. These three forces are also fundamental forces. Those are the four forces that give rise to everything else in nature. The electromagnetic force and the strong and the weak nuclear forces are forces that we observe at very small scales at the atomic and subatomic levels. All of these are non-contact forces. A contact force would be what we think of in the macroscopic realm, that is pretty much everyday life for you and I, something like a push or a pull, where you 
where you actually touch the object that you are applying the force to. A pull, whether you're pulling with a rope, or you're pulling on a handle, or you're pulling on a chain, for example, we call those a tension force. And then there are pushes. A push that is perpendicular, or 90 degrees, relative to a surface is called a normal force. And there's also a frictional force as well. Um, if you've got an object that is sliding on a surface, then there's always a frictional force which uh, operates in the direction opposite of the sliding motion. And the frictional force can change depend, uh, depending on the speed at which the object is sliding and depending on what type of surface uh, you're talking about. Fortunately for you, here in astronomy, we're not going to deal with frictional forces very often. How do we define force? Well, it's got to be a push or a pull, whether or not you're talking about contact or non-contact forces. If we're talking about a pull and you just want to measure it in everyday life, you could use something like a spring scale. For example, the kind of spring scale that you use to measure the downward force of your fruit and vegetables when you're measuring them on a scale in a grocery store. If you wanted to measure a push, you could use something like a bathroom scale. Normally, you stand on a bathroom scale and you measure the downward push that you have uh, on the surface of the scale, but you could also pick up the bathroom scale and uh, set it on the wall and see how many pounds of force you can apply to the wall. What direction is a force? Well, you can use your intuition. If you're pushing, it's in the direction of the push. If you're pulling, it's in the direction of the pull. A lot of our ideas about motion and forces didn't really come together until a little over 400 years ago. The Italian scientist Galileo uh, did many experiments having to do with force and motion, and he came up with s uh, several of the ideas that were later put together by Newton when he described gravity and his laws of motion. For example, Galileo wanted to know about acceleration due to gravity uh, towards the Earth. He didn't really have a good explanation of what gravity was, but he knew that the old ideas were incorrect. For example, the old ideas of motion and physics that uh, Aristotle uh, talked about many centuries before. Galileo tested these ideas and found out that many of them were wrong. Newton came later, and he looked at the uh, work of Galileo and the mathematician Kepler and was able to devise a brilliant uh, system of theories about how the natural world operated using forces in motion and he came up with the idea of gravity as an attractive force. In order to uh, work with all of these ideas he also had to invent some new mathematics to do that. Today calculus is often attributed to the work of Newton. So Newton's first law of motion is this. If there's no net force, that is, no unbalanced or extra force acting on some object, there's not going to be any acceleration. And by net force, I mean when you've added up all the forces on some object in every direction, if they're all balanced out, then there would be no net force. And thus, the object would not change its state of motion. It would not accelerate. But if there was an unbalanced force, then the object would accelerate. And that's the subject of Newton's second law. No acceleration gives rise to constant velocity. And so an object at rest will stay at rest until you have an unbalanced force. And if an object is in motion, like our toy car earlier, it will stay in motion at that constant velocity until an unbalanced force is uh, exerted onto it. You do not have to have a net force in order to have motion. A lot of people think that you have to be applying a force in order to cause motion. But forces do not cause motion, they cause acceleration.
How do we draw these? Often you'll see diagrams in this class where we draw an object using a dot and then arrows describing the forces that are acting on that object. And so we draw something called a free body diagram for objects if we want to analyze the forces. The arrow has a tail that is uh, attached to the dot and then it points in the direction that the force is being applied. The size of the arrow represents the size of the force. So here's an example. We've got a book sitting on a table. It's not accelerating. And so we can start to describe the forces that are acting on it and then draw it. Here's my free body diagram of the book on the table. The dot rep, uh, represents the book. I have gravitational force pointing down because the earth is pulling on the book with gravity. But I know that because the book is not accelerating, it's not changing its state of motion, that there has to be a force that's balanced with the gravitational force pointing down. And in this case, it's the normal force of the table pushing back up on the book. Note that the arrows are opposite in direction, but are the same magnitude. Some people may say that this is because of Newton's third law, but that's not correct. For Newton's third law, you need to be talking about two separate objects at the same time, and their action-reaction pairs that go with it. And so if I wanted to talk about the uh, action-reaction pair that goes along with the gravitational force of the Earth on the book, I would have to describe the gravitational force of the book on the Earth. Those are the ones that are paired up for Newton's third law, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that in another video. So Newton's second law goes like this. If you want to look at the how a force, uh, rather a net force, uh, affects an object, then you need to use Newton's second law. Let me give you a, an example that will help illustrate a few of these principles. Let's pretend that I've got a 50 pound uh, cube of dry ice. And that piece of dry ice is sitting on a table which uh, is a smoothly polished surface, like a piece of slate. The dry ice sublimates, and so a thin layer of gas forms between the dry ice and the slate, making it essentially frictionless. I don't have to deal with a sliding force. So I'm going to fill in the rest of the table here. For the motion of the block, I've got various situations that I would like to uh, create and or maintain. So when the block is at rest, its velocity is zero, its acceleration is zero, and I don't have to do anything to it in order to maintain that state of rest. Let's say that I find the block in uniform motion to the right. In that case, it's got velocity to the right, but because it's in uniform motion, it's not changing its velocity, and so it's not accelerating. And because of Newton's first law, I know that an object in motion will maintain that motion unless acted on by an outside force. So, push or pull necessary to maintain that motion? None. Let's say that I find the block and it's moving to the right and I want it to speed up to the right without changing direction. In that case, there will be velocity to the right and because it's changing its speed, that is, it's getting faster over time, it is accelerating and its acceleration is to the right. And in order to maintain that motion, if I want it to continue to speed up, moving to the right, I need to constantly be applying a force to the right on, uh, on the block. And it can't be balanced out with any other force. If I want it to move to the right, slow down, and then stop without changing direction, then I want it to move to the right. So it will have a velocity to the right. It will have acceleration but because it's slowing down, the acceleration will be to the left. And then, if I want it to stop without changing direction, I need to apply that force to the left on the block so that it accelerates to the left. And as soon as it stops, I need to let go because if I keep applying that force to the left, it will start moving to the left 
uh, when it gets to a zero speed. So that's how I would fill this in for uh, these different cases. What this tells you in the end is that the direction that an object accelerates is the same direction that the extra force is applied in, and that's the net force. So Newton's second law, net force causes acceleration, not velocity. The net force is the vector sum, or the additive sum of all the individual forces that are acting on an object. Mostly we'll be talking about one-dimensional motion in this class, but here's an example with two dimensions of motion. If we look at the block sliding down the hill, well, I know it's going down the hill, and I can identify some of the forces acting on the block. Well, in this case, I've got a gravitational force pointing down, and I've also got a force on the block from the surface of the hill, and it's perpendicular to the surface, and so it's pointing up and to the right. In this case, if I want to find out what the net force is on the object, I add these arrows together. In physics, you do this by taking one arrow, put the tail of the second arrow on the head of the first one, and then connect them together. The new arrow that connects them together is the net force. Look at how the net force is pointed down the hill, which means that the acceleration will be down the hill in the same direction as that net force. This should make sense. If you let go of the block, it will slide down the hill. I'm going to use words like mass and weight in future lectures. The mass of, mass of an object is how much matter there is packed into it, and then the weight is just the gravitational force that is pulling on that object. And that could vary from location to location. One of the main principles of Newton's second law goes like this. Let's say that I apply a force to a block. It's an unbalanced force, and so it will accelerate by some amount. But if I apply twice as much force to the same object, then I'll get twice the acceleration. And what that tells me is that the acceleration an object feels is directly proportional to the net force that is applied to it. But what if I keep the amount of net force applied to an object the same, but change the mass? So I've got a some amount of force being applied to a block, and I get some acceleration. If I keep the force the same, but double the mass of the object, I'm going to get half of the acceleration. Now what this tells me is that acceleration that an object experiences is inversely proportional to the mass. And so acceleration is proportional to one over the mass. So if I put all of this together, I can come up with one relationship, and it goes like this. Acceleration is the net force divided by the mass of the object. And uh, I can make an inequality by getting a constant in here, and I can define that constant to be 1. Some students like to write it like this. The net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And that's Newton's second law.